Hello again, my name is Dr. Jacob Gran, and in this video we will learn how to compose four voice part writing in the strict style. We'll learn about correct voicings and doublings of chords, as well as how to use Roman numerals to analyze chord progressions. Let's start by looking at an example of a four voice exercise by Thomas Atwood. When Atwood was about 20 years old, he traveled to Vienna to study counterpoint with Mozart, and this exercise, using Fuchs's Dornian Cantus Firmus, is from those studies. Before we get to Mozart's corrections, let's listen to Atwood's exercise and break it down. First, let's look at how Atwood cadences in four voices. Working from the bottom up, we can see a bass cadence in the bass voice, a soprano cadence in the tenor voice, and a tenor cadence in the alto voice. If those terms don't make sense to you, please revisit the previous video on composing with three voice chords and triads. Atwood needs to find a different kind of cadence for the soprano, and he comes up with a leap from scale degree 5 to a raised scale degree 3 for the final chord. Ending a minor mode composition with that accidental is known as a Picardy third, and is pretty common in the strict style of composition in the 18th century. Looking back at the rest of the exercise, we notice that there is a complete triad, either a 5-3 chord or a 6-3 chord, in every measure. Back when we were writing with only three voices, we had to make do sometimes with 8-3, 8-5, and 8-6 chords, which you can think of as incomplete triads. A triad has only three notes, and with access to four voices, there will no longer be a need to use an incomplete triad. In every measure, three of our voices will be able to smoothly reach a tone of a triad, while the fourth extra voice we'll have to double one of the triad tones by an octave. The only exception is the final chord of the exercise, where three of our voices typically end on scale degree one, which means that we've tripled rather than doubled that chord member. And the extra voice will have to make a third above the bass, as Atwood chooses here, or a fifth above the bass. The risk of accidentally composing parallel octaves is much greater in four-voice writing, because every measure now is going to contain at least one octave doubling. We want to check that those octaves are distributed between different voices in each measure. We can check that Atwood's exercise does not contain parallel octaves by noticing that in the first measure, the octave lies between the bass and alto voice in the second measure between the tenor and soprano, then the bass and tenor, bass and soprano, tenor and alto, bass and soprano, and in this case the notes are two octaves away, but we still think of it as an octave doubling, then the tenor and alto, bass and soprano, bass and tenor, bass and soprano, and in the last measure, like I said, there's a tripling of the note D in the bass, tenor, and alto. Atwood's exercise never allows the octave doubling to occur between the same two voices twice in a row, and this is a good way to guarantee that your exercise will not contain parallel octaves. In a similar way, we can check our exercise for the distribution of perfect fifths. I won't go through it blow by blow, but I do want to point out measures 1 and 2. Here we have fifths between the same voices, the bass and tenor, twice in a row. But obviously these are not parallel fifths because both voices remain stationary relative to one another, while the upper parts move in oblique motion. So there is no parallel motion to worry about. Let's get back to our first rule, that there must be a complete triad in every measure. That means our figured bass symbols are suddenly very uninformative compared to when we composed in three voices. Every measure either has a 5-3 or a 6-3 chord. 
Now that tells us a little bit about what each chord sounds like, but this type of labeling isn't very useful anymore. A better labeling for our four voice chords is known as Roman numeral analysis. To learn how this works, we can start with a 5-3 triad built on middle C. In the key of C major, this chord is a combination of scale degree 1, or Do in solfege syllables, scale degree 3, Mi, and scale degree 5, Sol. The exact same combination of scale degrees can be found in a 6-3 chord built on the bass note E. These two chords share a lot more in common with one another and sound more similar to one another than they do with other 5-3 chords and other 6-3 chords. For the sake of being thorough, we can also include this combination of a 6th and a 4th above the bass note G, which would also render the same combination of scale degrees. Although we wouldn't use this type of chord in our strict exercises because it contains a dissonant fourth above the bass. We can develop a system of labeling that emphasizes the commonality of these three chords by relabeling the scale degrees based on the role that they play in each chord. In this case, the bass note of our 5-3 position chord becomes known as the chordal root. The third above the bass becomes known as the chordal third and the fifth above the bass is the chordal fifth. The 5-3 version of this chord is known as the root position, since the chordal root occurs in the bass. This is the most consonant and the stablest way to combine these three scale degrees, and it is the version that would occur at the beginning or ending of a counterpoint exercise, or at a cadence at the end of a phrase of real music. We can think of the 6-3 chord built on E as a reordering of the same chord members, so that the chordal third occurs in the bass voice, which we refer to as the first inversion, or the first way to invert the chord. The dissonant 6-4 position chord places the chordal fifth in the bass, and is known as the second inversion. This perspective of 6-3 and 6-4 chords as inversions of an underlying 5-3 triad is known as fundamental bass, and was developed by Jean-Philippe Rameau in his Treatise on Harmony. Rameau would say that C is the root of all three of these chords, and it provides a fundamental bass, even when it is not literally the bass tone. I mentioned in the previous video, but I think it's worth repeating, that the particular voicings of the upper chord members doesn't affect our figured bass symbols or which tones we consider to be the chordal root, chordal third, and chordal fifth. Even if we were to scramble up the ordering of the top voices, all that matters for our labeling is the bass voice. In the key of C major, then, there are seven different root position 5-3 triads, one for each scale degree. We just spent some time looking at this chord, but each of the triads in this list could be inverted in exactly the same way to produce 6-3 and 6-4 chords. To label this triad in a way that will distinguish it from the others, we will simply call it by the scale degree of its root. In this case, the root is scale degree 1, so we label the chord with a Roman numeral 1. If you're wondering why we need to use Roman numerals, it's because we don't want to confuse our chord labels with the other ways we use numbers. We also use numbers in our figured bass symbols, when measuring intervals, and when talking about scale degrees, for instance. We can label the other triads based on the scale degree of their chordal root using Roman numerals. You might notice that some of the triads are labeled with uppercase Roman numerals, and others are lowercase. This is a convention that developed in the 19th century to distinguish between major and minor quality triads. I'm not going to go over the difference between major and minor triads in this video, since we use major and minor triads exactly the same way in our counterpoint exercises. Some of the older styles of Roman numeral labeling simply used uppercase for every triad, and I think that's fine too. 
Before we go back to look at Thomas Atwood's exercise, and to see how Mozart corrected him, we have to figure out what labeling to use in the Dorian mode. The Dorian mode uses the same white notes of the piano as the C major scale, but treats the note D as if it is scale degree 1. So our Roman numerals will have to shift over by 1, so that the D triad is treated as the 1 chord. Here is Atwood's exercise, relabeled with Roman numerals instead of figured bass symbols. This is much more informative about what these chords actually sound like. We use an Arabic numeral to indicate triads that are in first inversion. All the other triads are in root position, and they don't need any kind of Arabic numeral to clarify that they are 5-3 chords, because root position is assumed. Dissonant second inversion chords cannot be used in a strict composition exercise, but if they were here, they would be labeled with Arabic numerals 6-4 to indicate the inversion. This labeling packs a lot of information into a short space. It tells us the exact combination of scale degrees in each chord, the chord quality, and whether the chord is voiced in root position or in inversion. If we need to, figured bass symbols can be used to show accidentals, such as the leading tone in the penultimate five chord, and the Picardy third in the final one chord. Here are Mozart's corrections to Atwood's exercise. Atwood didn't make any big mistakes, like parallel fifths or anything like that, but Mozart adjusted some of the notes to improve the overall voice leading. The notes that are different are written in blue. Let's listen to Mozart's version. Mozart makes two major changes. First, he switches the two chords that Atwood had placed in first inversion to root position. He does not do this because he dislikes the sound of 6-3 chords. He does it because Atwood had given these first inversion chords a poor voicing. Atwood doubles the bass notes of these 6-3 chords, which C.P.E. Bach warns against in his essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments. Bach doesn't exactly explain why this is bad, but Mozart apparently also felt that this was a voicing that should be avoided if possible. In general, we can make two rules of thumb about doubling. First, doubling the bass voice is almost always a good idea, except with 6-3 chords. And, second, Avoid doubling active scale degrees like the leading tone at a cadence. Tendency tones have a will of their own, and one of the doubled voices will have to move awkwardly in order to avoid parallel octaves. The second change is aimed at rewriting Atwood's cadence. Mozart places the soprano cadence in the soprano voice, which is a much stronger melodic conclusion than the cadence Atwood had composed. In general, in four-voice writing, the most important voices are the outer voices, the bass and the soprano. The inner voices, tenor and alto, are less clearly audible, and so you can kind of hide the weaker cadences in the inner voices. Mozart asks the tenor to just repeat scale degree 5 three times in a row, which, if we heard it on its own, wouldn't sound like any kind of cadence at all. This is the tendency in four-voice writing. The voices become more differentiated from one another and more idiomatic. The soprano gets the best melodic material. The bass line is concerned with harmonic support, and so we tolerate more leaps in the bass. And while the inner voices are typically very smooth, with lots of repeated tones, they're also typically boring, with the least amount of goal-directed motion. We won't be able to overcome these inequalities in the voices until we can add greater rhythmic variety in subsequent exercises. 
Here are two new cantus firmae by the German musicologist Heinrich Bellermann. The first is in the Mixolydian mode, and when you apply Roman numerals to the chords of this exercise, you will need to treat G as scale degree 1, and raise the note F to an F sharp as a leading tone at the cadence. The second is in the Dorian mode, and we've just seen examples of Roman numerals used in the Dorian mode. There are eight possible exercises you could compose using these cantus firmae by placing them once each in the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass voices. I would recommend trying to do all eight combinations. Don't just assume that if you can do one, you can do them all. Composing with a given bass line is actually quite different than composing with a given inner voice or a given melody. Stay tuned for the next video, when we will begin to look at how the fundamental voice-leading dissonances lead to dissonant chord types in three- and four-voice composition.